We are in uh, the book of Genesis, and we are looking today at, at probably one of my absolute favorite characters in the Old Testament. We are going to look at the life of Joseph. I always liked Joseph. I appreciated Joseph because he was, uh, for the most part, the youngest in his families, in his family, and uh, his siblings were either trying to kill him or sell him off, and, and I could just relate being the youngest in my family um, and what I went through, but actually it was nothing like uh, Joseph. Joseph is a main character in the book of Genesis. You will actually see that his story comprises about 25% of that book, so it's a rather lengthy portion of Scripture, and I'm going to do my best to... Uh, tie all those chapters together for us this morning. Joseph is a man who lived a life which, uh, as we will look at it, will uh, bring us to the question ourselves of how would our perspective, our view of life, be different if we believed that God was there in every absolute moment, the good and the bad, because this is what Joseph believed. And so we're, we're going to see that in his life and, and how he, he lived that out. Let me give you just a little bit of background. We'll kind of rewind a little bit, just going back to the family tree, starting there at uh, Abraham, and as we followed Abraham and uh, he and <coughs> Sarah having their promised son, uh, Isaac, uh, when Abraham was 100 years old. And so Isaac uh, marries Rebekah. They have twin boys, Esau and Jacob. We looked at this last week and how uh, Esau was the oldest and by far his father Isaac's favorite. Jacob, on the other hand, was his mother's favorite. And, but Jacob was uh, pretty shifty pretty scheming. He, he basically tricks his father, deceives him, uh, pretends to be his brother, and gets the blessing intended for the oldest, and then he has to flee. And so we looked at the story of Jacob last week and how he went to his uncle Laban and, and fell in love with Laban's youngest daughter, Rachel, and, and worked seven years. And then as we followed that story, uh, Laban pulls a fast one and switches his daughter, so he ends up uh, marrying Leah. And, but all's not lost for working just another seven years. He can have Rachel too, so hey. Um, and as we just follow that episode of, of having children or not having children, uh, lo and behold, Rachel eventually has a son, and his name is Joseph. And if you notice, I put Joseph and the 11 others, right? Because that's kind of how Jacob saw this, which I think is kind of interesting given that he was raised in a home uh, where he was not his father's favorite, and he knew how hard that is. Isn't that something that, that you know, when our parents raise us, there's things they do that we're just like, man, I will never do that. And then we turn around and we do the exact same thing, all right? And that's, that's what you see here, if you have your Bibles, uh, let's go to chapter 37 of Genesis, and uh, I want to point your attention first. It, oh, if you don't have a Bible, look under the seat in front of you, and if you need one, take that, take that Bible. Um, we want you to have uh, the Word of God in your possession. So, uh, look at verse 3 in chapter 37. I'm, I'm not making this up when I talk about uh, Joseph being the favorite. It says, now Israel, Israel was the name for Jacob, right? He'd had a name change, and so now it's no longer Jacob, but Israel. It says, now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age. You know, it's like after the brothers died and they got to heaven and they were reading the Bible themselves, they're like, I knew it. I knew it. He was the favorite says right here, he says he was the favorite. It says, um, and he made him a robe of many colors, right? But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. So here's this young man of 17, 
He's the youngest. He is spoiled. He's the favorite. He's daddy's little boy. He can do no wrong. He gets the coat. And, and it wasn't just that it was a coat of many colors. It was a long sleeve coat. And the, the symbolism of that is that the one who wears it is the one who does no work. All right? I've got the coat. You guys need to go out and get some things done. I'm just going to hang out here and play with my brand new horse and wagon that daddy bought me, right? You guys had to get yours at the junkyard. I got mine new. And I was like, every, he, got, he got everything he wanted. They always made his favorite foods, you know. I'm just like, man, this is my childhood. No. <laughs> no, but he, had a, he was by far the absolute favorite. And what did you see, the ramifications of that? Um, you saw that his brothers hated him. They hated him. And then here comes Joseph. One, one, one night he has a dream, so that the next day he's sharing with his brothers, he, and they already don't like him, and now he's just going to push their button, right? And he's like, hey, you guys want to hear something awesome? They're like, what? He's like, I had this dream. Like, we were all out, you know, harvesting wheat, and, and we were putting them in sheaves, and you know what was really cool is, like, my sheave just, like, grew, and it was ginormous, and all your sheaves bow down to mine. Isn't that cool? And they're just like, we hate you. <laughs> <All right? laughs> and to make matters worse, then he comes back again. He's like, hey, guys, I had another dream. You want to hear it? No. Well, listen. So here I was, and here's the sun and the moon and the stars. Now the stars are you guys, and guess what? They all bowed down to me. Isn't that awesome? And they're like, we hate you even more. Right? <laughs> And so it says one day the brothers are all out, you know, with the sheep and doing what shepherds do. And, and Jacob decides to send Joseph out to see how they're doing. And so <coughs> they see Joseph coming, and they determine that um, they're like, you know what, here he comes. Don't you just hate him? Let's take, how many of you hate him? And they're all like, oh, yeah. They're like, let's kill him. Yeah. Right? And they're all like, let's like kill this kid. And, and fortunately, he had some prevailing cooler heads. They're like, no, Reuben's like, let's just throw him in a pit and make him suffer. You know, no water. He's just in a hot pit all day. So they throw him in the pit. And so while he's down there suffering, then, then Judah, his other brother, gets this great idea. And he's like, you know what? Guys, if we kill him, we got nothing. What if we sell him? How many of you have ever had thoughts of selling your sibling? right? <laughs> You're like, we could make some cash, right? Have a little party. And, and so basically they, they, they see, they're like, let's sell them to the Ishmaelites. Remember, this is Ishmael's family, right? And they're like, let's sell them to him. And so, you know, they, they, they come across, it's like the Ishmaelites and the Midianites. And basically they sell, they sell Joseph off. He changes hands and he ends up in Egypt and is sold as a slave in Egypt. Can you imagine that? Your own family selling you into slavery, your own brothers. And, and so we pick up this story here in chapter 39 where he's been sold to Potiphar. Potiphar is the, um, basically the captain. He is the head of the Egyptian army, very powerful man. And so Joseph ends up being sold to him. And I want you to look here in chapter 39, verse 2, and I want you to look at what it says. The Lord was with Joseph. Really? Really? God, you're with me? My brothers just sold me into slavery. He is taken Hundreds of miles from home. He is separated. No longer around family. Nobody he knows. He's in a strange country. He has no choice. He's a slave. And yet it says the Lord was with him. See, this is a crucial, listen, this is a crucial point for Joseph. This is a crucial point because it's at this point that, that Joseph, I mean, he could have easily said, God, You've forsaken me. What happened, God? Where were you? And if you're going to be like this, 
if you're going to let this kind of stuff happen to me, I don't want anything to do with you. Anybody ever had thoughts like that when life turns south? He could have done that. And you know what? That would have been the end of the story right there. But Joseph doesn't. See, what happens to your perspective? What happens to your thought processes when you begin to understand and recognize and believe that God has his hand on you and has had his hand on you from the beginning? Through all the bad, all the the stuff that went south, through the good, what if you believe that? What's that do to your perspective about God and your relationship with him? Because this is, where, this is where Joseph is at. So in verse 39, it says that, that the Lord was with, or in chapter 39, it says, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Go down, jump on down to verse, um, verse 6 here. It says that, <coughs> so he, Potiphar, left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. I mean, Potiphar, he recognizes that this kid is blessed. This young man's blessed. It's like God's hand is on him. And so he didn't concern himself about anything except... Hey, what's for supper? What are we having? Some of that Egyptian bread, right? Some good stuff. I mean, but now go on down a little bit farther in six, the next part of six. It says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Uh, Do you remember what it said about Joseph's mother? That she was beautiful in face and form. Guys, this is just a good-looking family, flat out, right? Because she was just like drop-dead gorgeous. And now here's Joseph. He is one hunk of a man, and he's good-looking. That's what it's telling us, right? And it tells us that because of what's about to happen. It says, he was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. So here we have the the first spotting of a cougar in the Bible. <laughs> she is she is after this young guy, right? She's she's gonna she's going after him and and but here's what I want you to notice and, and to me this is this is key here. She's going after him and and look at um, verse eight. It says, but he refused. And said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? I want you to catch that. See, we're not given a lot of details about Joseph and how he was raised, but here he is. He's hundreds of miles away from home, from family, from what he's always known. And do you hear his conviction? How, how could I sin against God? This tells me that, that however he was raised, one thing, his parents instilled in him who God is. Parents, you have to point your kids continually to God and their relationship with him. You have to. You have to always be pointing them uh, it, that it is all about knowing him and walking with him. Because there is going to come a day when those kids will no longer be under your roof. And how many of you parents know that's a kind of terrifying sometimes? Right? And you're just like, oh, man. And that's why you tie everything, everything in their life ties into their relationship with God. And you want to reinforce that because there'll come a point in time where they are far away from you. And trust me, the world's going to come and say, lie with me. And I pray that because of what you've poured in and how God's worked in your life and your family's life, that, that your, your kids are going to be like, 
man, how could I do that? How could I dishonor God like that? You understand why it's important? We don't, we don't wait like for a certain age. You start them right off the bat. You start telling them about how much God loves them and, and how God has made them and to, to know him and to walk with him. And you just keep pointing them back to him. You don't have to have all the theological answers figured out. Just keep pointing. You know what? Let God work in their life. Let him work in their heart so that one day when your kid is out away from you, he's going to have a similar response here that Joseph did. And, and you know what? If your kids are older or your grandparents, don't be like, well, I guess it's too late now. No, it's not. <laughs> just keep pointing them. I don't care how old they are. You're just like, you know what? I, I may not have done this when you were younger, but I'm starting it now, buddy, because this is absolute truth. And you want to just ground your kids in truth. And so you hear you have uh, Joseph, and he's like, man, I could not sin against God, but this does not seem to phase Potiphar's wife. She is still coming hard after him to the point where basically uh, she grabs a hold of, of Joseph, and he runs out and leaves his robe, tunic, whatever he's wearing in her hand. And so she basically accuses him of rape. And Potiphar comes home, and he is so angry, and he has, he has him thrown into prison. That's what we pick up in verse, in verse 20. It says, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. I, I do think that, that most likely Potiphar, I mean, he knew his wife. I have a feeling that he kind of suspected her a little bit in, you know, in this, because I think that otherwise he would have just killed Joseph. I, I think being a slave, he wouldn't have even tolerated anything, but there's been a lot of history there, so instead of killing him, he, he has him put in prison. So now we've gone from being tossed in a, or in a pit, sold into slavery, and just when you think it couldn't get worse, anybody ever had that? I don't think it could get worse than this. Guess what? Bing! It just turned south again. So now he's in prison. And in verse 21, look at what it says. <clears throat> but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. The Lord was with Joseph. Here again, here again, Crucial point in Joseph's life. How are you going to respond when it just got worse? Because he could have been like, God, all right, it was bad, and now you've allowed this to happen. What is up? I cannot believe you would do this to me. I cannot believe I am innocent, and, and now I'm falsely accused, and now I'm in prison. But here's the thing about Joseph is he just, you know what? He entrusts himself to God. That's what I love about him. He, and he just, he just keeps at it. He, now he's working in a prison and, and, you know, he's doing his best. And look at verse, or chapter 40. It says, sometime after this. So he's been placed in prison. And now it's not just a short time. He's there for a good bit. He's there in prison. God blesses him to the point that, you know what? The jailer puts Joseph in charge. Now, this is not, even though he's in charge and he's been given those privileges, this is not where he wants to be. Who wants to be in prison? And these prisons weren't made for comfort. They were stinky and damp and not very nice. And so, but here he is and he's doing the best he can. And then lo and behold, the cupbearer, Pharaoh's cupbearer and his baker tick Pharaoh off. They tick him off and he has him thrown in prison. And uh, so Joseph is going through his routine, taking care of the prisoners, and he notices that they're, they're both, like, very dejected. They're, they're pretty bummed. And he's like, hey, guys, what's up? This is a prison. This is supposed to be a happy place, you know? <laughs> what's wrong with you? But he's like, man, you guys are more depressed than most normal prisoners, right? Uh, and they're like, man, we had these dreams, and we don't know what they mean. He's like, well, tell me. And so they tell him, and he's like, well, 
here's what these dreams mean. And so he tells the cupbearer. Now, the cupbearer is like, is like Pharaoh's right-hand man. It's a very prominent position. He's the one, uh, he's there uh, advising. You know, it's just not like he holds cups, right? Um, he is there advising Pharaoh. He does taste everything that comes across Pharaoh's plate in case it's poison. So it's like a job with a real serious commitment. Uh, health insurance plan is lousy because if you're poisoned, you're dead, and who needs insurance after that? But um, anyway, <coughs> he tells him, he says, oh, you know, he listens to his dream, and he's like, hey, well, in three days, you're going to be restored back to your position. And, and the baker's like, oh, he got a good he got a good interpretation. So he's like, okay, well, here's mine. And he tells Joseph his, you know, about having a basket of bread on his head and the birds come and eat it. And Joseph is like, sorry, uh, like in three days, Pharaoh's going to hang you and the birds are going to eat your flesh. Well, thanks for the encouraging word. Right? I mean, he's just like, bummer. And so sure enough, in three days, it's Pharaoh's birthday. Uh, if you're into Bible trivia, please note this is the first mention of a birthday in the Bible. So just giving you a heads up in case you're doing Bible trivia. Right? It's the first birthday. It's Pharaoh's birthday, and just exactly what Joseph has said would happen, happens. And he had told the cupberries, like, listen, remember me. You, you know, Pharaoh's going to restore you. Please tell him about, please tell him about me, how I was taken out of my homeland and and basically sold into slavery, and then I was put in prison for something I never did. And the cupbearer's like, you got it, absolutely. Anybody ever told you they won't forget you? <laughs> and, and they forgot you? And that's what happens here. That's what happens here. In chapter 41, if you look at the beginning of 41, it says, after two whole years... Can you imagine that? You're in a place that you don't want to be, and, and you see an opportunity maybe to get out, and you're, and you're telling that person that you're kind of hoping they'll get you out, and, they're, and you're like, don't forget me. And they're like, oh, I'll never forget you. Do, you. do you think how agonizing those first weeks were? Just kind of always looking, you know, has he, has he remembered me yet? Am I getting out of here? And... And you know when you're in a place that you don't want to be and you're longing to get out and it just doesn't come? And, and that's where Joseph is. And how hard is that? How many of us get stuck in, in the mundane and in a place where we're just like, man, I just want out of here. Do you think God was with him at this point? I think so. And yet, and yet God was letting him just work those days there in that prison going through the same routine. And Joseph just stayed faithful, did what he was called to do. And then as you read the story, we read that Pharaoh, Pharaoh had some really weird dreams. It's like he ate spicy food one night. I don't know, but he, he had this weird dream of six fat cows and six skinny cows came and ate the fat cows. And it was so strange, he woke up and he's like, wow, that was seriously weird. So he goes back to sleep, and then he dreams about six fat ears of corn, and then, or seven. I, did I say, I meant seven if I said six. I mean seven, and we're cutting back in this service, so, uh, <laughs> but I mean seven. And um, seven skinny ears then come, and they eat up those seven fat ears of corn, and Pharaoh's like, this is too weird. Who can tell me? what it means and he tells his people nobody knows and then the cupbearer's like you know what I hate to bring this up because it was just not the best of times but remember when you tossed me in prison I had a dream and there was this young Hebrew who told me what it meant so boom just like that you imagine your life changing just like that Joseph is summoned to the Pharaoh they clean him up take a bath they shave him bald because that's how they looked back then right and Pharaoh's like, can you tell me my dream? And, and so Joseph interprets the dream. And he's like, that means there's going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And you need to find a wise man who will know how to prepare during the seven years of, of good to prepare for the seven years of bad. And Pharaoh's like, 
you're our man. And so all of a sudden, Joseph is gone from pit to prison to the palace. Don't you love that story? It's like, boom, life changed. And so as the famine spread, it got to the point where we then read that Jacob and his family, well, they were running out of food. So Jacob sends all his sons except for Benjamin, his youngest, because he doesn't want anything to happen to the youngest since he lost Joseph. He's like, you go get us some grain. So they go, and it says that Joseph recognized his brothers at once, but they had not a clue who he was, mainly because he was shaved bald and walked like an Egyptian. Right? I, <laughs> I know, I just wanted to put that song in there so bad. Um, but yeah, they didn't recognize him. So he takes them through a series of tests. He's testing. He wants to know how have his brothers changed. And he takes them through this whole series of tests. And finally, when we get to turn to chapter 45, just uh, kind of the heart tug, heart tug moment in chapter 45, it says, then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. This is one of those oh snap moments that you read in the Bible. They were like completely dumbfounded. See, up to this point, they'd had an interpreter because he was Egyptian and, and they were Hebrew, right? So they spoke Hebrew, he spoke Egyptian. He still knew Hebrew. So he starts talking to them in their language and he's like, it's me, Joseph. And can you imagine the wheels turning? And you're just like, wait, this is our little brother, the one that we sold into slavery. This could go very bad for us. That's what I'm thinking. He's now in charge of all of Egypt. But, but look at what he says in verse 4. He says, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. How would your perspective of life changed if you held fast to the fact that God had his hand on you through every event in your life how would it change Joseph's perspective here to me is amazing here's his brothers who he knows man these guys they, they sold me and he's saying don't don't be distressed, because God sent me here. In fact, look down at verse 8. He says, so it was not you who sent me here. It's not you who sent me here, but God. What a perspective. What a perspective. And so, so what you have is, is uh, I, I love this, because after they get over the shock, he sends them back and and uh, verse 25 there in chapter 45, it says, So they, they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. And they told him, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart became none, because, or for he did not believe them. Can you imagine that shock? This is your son who you love that all these years, man, you thought he was dead. You thought he was gone, and now they're, they're your boy. Somebody's got some splaining to do. That's what I'm saying, right? He's <laughs> like, wait, wait, what? He's not dead. He's and he's ruler, and and he just he couldn't grasp it until he began to look at, at all the wagons and and the treasures that that Joseph has sent back, and then and then I just I gotta stick this in here because it's like my favorite part. Uh, it always gets me choked up, right? In verse 29 of 46, it says, Then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. He presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. That means a long time. 
Man, I just, I love that. When God does the impossible, when, when the things that we think will never happen and, and God just pulls them right out. If we uh, follow this story, we'll see that the family, Jacob and all the, the family, they all settle in the land of Goshen. And eventually, eventually we get to the point, as life does, and Jacob passes away. And uh, just go with me over here to chapter 50, the last, fifth, or the last chapter in Genesis. It says, when Joseph, I'm at verse 15, I'm going to put that up there. <clears throat> when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did him. See, up to this point, they didn't know that they could really trust Joseph, right? Because, I mean, he'd been real nice to him. But anybody ever have somebody, you know, like uh, uh, they're acting one way and then something happens and they just turn on you? I mean, that's what they're afraid of. Now dad's gone. He's going to come after us. It says, so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So here we have Joseph's story. And, and just to pull a couple of things out of it for you. As I've said, as we work our way through the Old Testament, what we will see in the Old Testament is that it will continually point us to Jesus. It will continually be giving us that, that, that image of the one who is to come. And, and maybe on your own time, you can read all the details of Joseph fly, Joseph's life. But here's what I want you to understand. It is a picture of the one who is to come. There's just some remarkable similarities. That, that one day, they will, there will be a Savior who walks a very similar path. And that he is very much loved by his Father. And he is sent to his brothers. His brothers, in turn, hate him, reject him, and even betray him and sell him for the price of a slave. Now, in Joseph's story, Joseph goes to prison. When we follow Christ's story, it's not just prison, it's death. Death on a cross. And yet, just as Joseph is taken out of a pit and a prison and placed on a throne, we have the exact same imagery of what Christ did. As he was put to death and then comes out, conquers death, comes out of that pit and is on, a, is on the throne today. And it's from that throne, just as Joseph in his position, now on the throne, his position of authority, he didn't exact vengeance on his brothers, did he? He offered forgiveness and salvation in the same way that, that Christ does for us. And, and, and to me, the, the, thing, the touching thing is, you know what, just as, as Joseph, man, he just shed tears to have his brothers back. You understand that, that Christ weeps tears of joy at our reconciliation with God. The angels, man, they rejoice. They celebrate. So this story is, is clearly a picture of Christ and what Christ will do. Now the other thing for us in the story of Joseph that I think we have to walk away from here and, and get a good grasp on personally is that it shows us that God is in full control of everything. How would your perception and perspective uh, and your view of life and, and living life be if you hold to that firmly? 
I know that some of you have gone through some very hard things in life. And yet, here's what I would tell you. God will always remain faithful. And he's always had his hand on you. And he understands that. When when we look at at Joseph's life, and and, in verse 20, when he's speaking to his brothers, and he says, you meant evil against me. I mean, he named it for what it was. He didn't, like, make little of it. He wasn't like, you know, you bunch of knuckleheads selling your brother into slavery. Come on, what was up with that? He's like, you man it. That was evil. That was an evil thing to do. But you know what? God man it for good. See, we have, to, we have to get our mind around this, that God can take the evil things, the things that people do to us, and God, because of who he is and, and because we belong to him, can override that and turn it to good as only, as only God can. This is what faith is. I mean, some of you are in in places right now and you just wonder, has God forgotten me? No. No. He's at work. Here's the thing. See, knowing that God has a plan and everything does not mean that you can always see it. Doesn't mean you will always be able to see what is happening. Again, this is where faith comes in. This is where in the midst of when it's hard, I'm just like, okay, God, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you. You know, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, do not lean on your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will make your path straight. Quit trying to figure it out. It's kind of very much like a tapestry. Have you ever looked on the back of a tapestry? I mean, here's the back of one. I mean, to me, it, it looks like a, just a mess, like somebody barfed yarn, right? It's just like everywhere. Uh, yet you flip it over, and this is the other side, that there's actually a design and an order that, you know what, you could not see. This is what God does. This is, this is why we put our faith in him. This is why we put our faith, in, and we keep uh, reinforcing that in our understanding that, that he's good, he's faithful. Even when you may not feel it, even when he may seem a thousand miles away, we know who he is because he tells us, and we cling to that. We hold, we hold fast to that, and it's only God. Some of you have been through lives that have been broken and shattered, And you've had people toss you in a pit and put you in a prison. That's hard. And yet God is a God who can take that which has been broken and bring it back together. There's a form of pottery. I don't know if I can say it right. Kintsuji, I I think, is how it's pronounced. It's Japanese pottery. And I thought this was fascinating because um, centuries old, And basically it came about because um, the rulers of Japan, the warlords, uh, as they had nice pieces of pottery made, they would inevitably get broken. And they wanted them repaired. And so they would send them to the pottery masters to fix them. But basically they'd get back stapled pottery, which just doesn't look good. And then one of the masters designed a way came up with a way where he took the pieces of pottery and he fused them back together with gold. They would use gold, they would use silver, any precious metal, and and restore this piece of pottery that was basically worthless and had lost its value and its purpose. And they would fuse it back together with gold so that actually that piece of pottery now was far more valuable than it even began. And see, this is what God does with lives. He puts them back together. He brings the healing. That's why when we we look at Romans 8.28, if you have your Bibles, just flip there. And and I would tell you this. uh, I don't know if you're one for marking in your Bible, but this is a verse to mark. 
Romans 8, 28. As it says, for God causes all things to work together for good, for those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 29, though, gives us the reason. And that is to conform us, to conform us to the image of Christ. Sometimes we do not get what God is doing. And it's hard to see. But, but let us have the perspective of, of Joseph. Let us have that perspective that, that when we look back, even, even the, the hurtful things, the painful things, we, we trust God with. And we say, God, you know what? I, I don't get why that happened. I don't get why that unfolded that way. But I belong to you, and you can bring good out of it. See, because God can bring good. This is... Church, this is a hard thing, um, that God works through suffering. It's not our favorite topic. But I was like, hey, who wants to suffer? Anybody want to go through hard, anything hard? No, none of us want to do that. Let me see if I can explain something to you real quick. God works through suffering because this world is a broken world. I, I think everybody gets that. You and I belong to God, okay? You are His. He takes care of you. He watches over you. He, he cherishes you. He will use you and allow those hurtful things in. Is that because He's mean? No, it's because he's got you, and, and, and you are here amidst a world that is broken and hurting. This world already is out here experiencing these things. What God needs is his children who belong to him that they can connect and relate and show these people out here and tell them about the one who healed their brokenness. So God will allow us those difficult things. He'll, he'll allow us the cancers of life, the miscarriages, the death. We'll experience that because of this world, but God has a greater plan and a greater work in mind. And, and the thing is, when we belong to him, we, we can trust him with it. We don't have to live in fear. See, even when it's hard, he'll walk us through it. He'll walk you through it. Now, one last thing I want to touch on here from Joseph's life that I think is so important for us. When you look at Joseph's life, his perspective is, is Joseph's ability to forgive. I mean, what his family did, what his brothers did to him was not a little thing. I mean, the reality of that, being sold into slavery, not even knowing, you know what? It's like they sold him off and they didn't even know if he was even alive and they didn't care. They didn't care. As far as they knew, he was gone and dead. Do you ever have anybody hurt you to that depth and degree? I mean, some of us have had people do some very, very painful things. And so here's the thing about forgiveness. We're all called to it. And, and I know some of us are like, well, you, you may not understand what that person did to me. Well, I may not, but God does. There, there is nothing that anyone has done to us that we have not done worse to God. And God calls us to forgive because he knows that unforgiveness, when we allow bitterness and unforgiveness to reside in our life, it actually becomes detrimental to us. When you look at the, the meaning of forgiveness, it means this. It means to let go. To let go from one's power, possession, to let go free, let escape, to cut someone loose. When you do not forgive someone, that is basically what you are doing is tying that person to your back and carrying them around with you. How tiring is that? And so forgiveness is actually cutting them loose 
and just letting, letting God take care of it. See, you belong to God. You're not, you don't have to deal with that. You can cut them loose and be free of that because that's how God wants us to live. And, and if we refuse to forgive and to let go, basically we're, we're, we're kind of in a sense binding God's hand about bringing all things together for good. And, and that's why, you know, think about this. In the Lord's Prayer, he said, you know, when he, te- when he taught us to pray, he's like, Forgive me of my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. See, God doesn't want us tied down with that. There's such a temptation, though, because when people hurt us, we want them to pay. But we have to let go. We have to have that perspective of of Joseph and just say, you know what? I can trust God with this. So as we close, I just want to challenge you. Where you're at in life right now, is it hard for you to recognize God's hand on your life? I know some of you are in some places that are very challenging. Some of you are in the mundane and you're waiting for God to move and God to work. And I would just encourage you, you hold fast to him. You hold fast and you speak your faith in who he is and his goodness. And and if you're here this morning and you know what? You've got people in your life who have pushed you in pits, people who have tossed you in prisons, people who have sought to do evil. Let them go. Cut them loose. There's freedom in that. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up as we uh, close out here. Would you uh, stand and let me close this in prayer? Father God, as we... Uh, close our time together I, I i pray for those who are here today just <clears throat> maybe we wrestle with where we're at in life and just if you're at work i pray that that joseph's story would encourage them would encourage them and let us be a people who cling and hold fast to you and just trust in your goodness and your character put our confidence in you and And Father, for that heart here today who maybe has to work through issues of forgiveness of of people in their life who have have intended evil and hurt, I pray that you would help them to forgive. Father, you don't call us to anything that you will not help us to do and, and, and help them to hand that over. It's not based on how we feel about it. It's just based on us acting on what you've told us to do. Thank you for your work. In Jesus' name, amen.